Yeah, thanks, Ralph. Um, yeah, I will talk about some thoughts we, we had been implementing an executor for our safety certified fork of ROS2, which is EpixOS. So what are the ROS users used to? William already mentioned it. So you have nodes, nodes have publishers, subscriptions, clients, services, timers. And then you have an executor that reacts on events like the publisher sends a message, a client sends a request, a timer expires, and the executor then executes callbacks that are related to these events. This could be done the subscription callbacks, service callbacks, timer callbacks. So how can you implement such an executor? You can use an, an active object pattern where you have an, an executor with an event queue. It has its own thread of control, so you can decouple from the event producers. You can use a, like a condition variable to wait on new events arriving at the queue. Uh, then you can take the event out of the queue, have one or multiple threads, um, and then do the tasks that are related to these events. And this is exactly how it was implemented in ROS1. And for me, this is a, a perfect match when I have events that are related to a specific task. And I often saw this in the past when I had a look at frameworks that are used in infotainment. So there you have some kind of user interaction, like a user presses a button, and then you have to execute a, a task related to, to this event. But some things are different with Rust 2, right? We have now DDS as a middleware, and DDS has data readers, and these already queue messages in the so-called reader caches. We have the event interaction that we already heard with listeners and wait sets. So for the listeners, you will have a thread in the middleware that executes uh, a callback registered by the user. And with the wait set, you have a user thread that waits on the wait set uh, to get triggered. And the current has two default executors uh, are based on such a wait set. Um, you attach all these entities like subscriptions and, and, and um, services to, to the wait set. And the executor has a thread that waits um, for the wait set to get triggered, then checks for all the entities that have some, some new data and executes the callbacks. And this has two separate yeah, paths, I would say, um, one for the events um, and one for taking the messages from the middleware. Yeah, sure, you can also have the ROS1 event queue bag, and uh, this is exactly what Alberto uh, presented. So then we have more like a, a listener approach. Um, we register callbacks, um, and a, a listener thread in the middleware will then yeah, execute these callbacks. You can have an event queue, um, again, to, to, to queue these events, and the executor then will, um, again, execute and uh, the related tasks uh, related to these events. But my use case is another one. And um, I can second Jan um, because I have a similar use case as, as you currently presented. Um, so typical use case is I have a node with several subscriptions and these subscriptions have different update frequencies like the Fusion node we see on, on this image here. So it has some camera uh, topic, um, a, a radar topic and a transformation topic and it has all subscriptions um, for these topics. And this node has to execute a specific task. And the task here is um, fuse the radar objects with the latest camera objects and use the latest transformation for this. So the node task shall be executed whenever a specific condition is met. And in this simple case, it's whenever there's a new radar message um, to the fusion because the, uh, the radar is your, your leading sensor here um, and shall trigger the fusion. So sure, you can um, now implement this and, and have individual callbacks for, for all these subscriptions, but the question is if this is really a, a, still a perfect match here. Because why should I handle all the callbacks for messages that are not really needed for my task? And these are the, the messages that are marked here with the cross. And why should I take care of the message caching on, on, on user side? Um, when DDS could already do this for me, and therefore DDS has this history quality of service. So why should I bother with all these unnecessary context switches when I could avoid them? And 
wouldn't it be good if uh, the node just would be executed uh, whenever uh, it, the execution condition is met and it, the task shall be done? So here are the, the, the building blocks we, we have for our Apex OS executor. We introduced a, a new node base class um, that provides two additional public methods. One is called execute, um, and this will be called by the executor whenever the, um, the execution condition is met. The second one is get triggering subscriptions. So this will also be called by the executor to ask the node for all the subscriptions that shall trigger the node execution. Then we have a polling subscription and this is how it's worse than it is. Um, we don't really poll for the data all the time. We, we take the data if, if it's time to, and uh, if it's time to take the data when the execution condition is met and the executor will call the execute method of the node. And with this polling subscription, we also allow the read and take of the messages. And this is exactly the, the API that DDS normally provides for consuming the messages. With this polling subscription, uh, you can also now drop uninteresting messages already in the middleware. So like uh, you set a history quality of service to one, uh, you're only interested in latest, greatest messages. Um, so all the other messages can already be dropped in the middleware and you don't have a context switch to, to the user space and have to process them. We use a more efficient um, implementation of the weight set and, and bypass some, some, some of the layers of, of ROS and only attach to the weight set the events that are really relevant for the node execution. And then we put all these together with some, some more building blocks um, and build an executor that calls this execute method whenever there's um, a triggering event. Uh, optionally, you can also provide a, an execution condition that will be evaluated whenever there's a triggering event and then uh, decides with the return value if the node shall be executed or not. So can you do this with ROS2 today? Not straightforward. Um, William already presented um, the RCS CBP weight set. So it's possible to, to have this weight set now um, in the user code and with Foxy also a take method for the subscriptions were introduced, but you need more like the, the things that I just described to to really build an executor out of this. So here are some examples um, how this thing could look like. On the left-hand side, we see the node implementation. On the right-hand side, we see our main. So we have the fusion example here. Um, this has the radar as triggering subscription. So our get triggering subscription call will return the, the radar subscription. In the execute implementation, we can now take all the messages from all the subscription and process them. And on the right-hand side, we see now we can, like, like people are used to, create a node, create an executor, add the node to the executor, and the run call is like, like the spin call in Rust 2. So now the execute impl will always be called whenever a new radar message arrives. Here we see uh, the planner example, like the, the, the planner node we have in, in our reference system. So I have a node that shall be executed cyclically like every 100 milliseconds. And this has not really a, a triggering subscription then. So all the subscriptions um, are non-triggering and I don't have to implement this get triggering subscription method. And in my execute implementation, I can again go to all these subscriptions, take all the messages and process them. On the right-hand side, we see um, when I add a node to the executor, I can also provide a cyclic timer. Now, a more complex execution condition. So I don't wanna have the, the, the fusion to be executed whenever there's a, a radar sample, but I want to have that there's at least one radar and one camera message. So in this case, we have two triggering subscriptions. So my get triggering subscription call will now return radar and camera. And we provide an additional method with a bool return that will check if the execution condition will be fulfilled. And this can be fully implemented um, on, you know, as, as, as the user likes. And in this case here, 
we we leave the messages in the in the DS cache. We call it the read. Um, so the read uh, checks the messages. And in this case here, if we have at least one message for both of these subscriptions, we return true. And on the right hand side, you now see that you can pass an additional lambda here um, when you add a node and say, okay, I add this node to the executor, but uh, execute this node only when this ready message returns true. And this will be called whenever there's a triggering event. Now coming to the reference system. So we also used all the four cores of the Raspberry Pi. The benefit is that we have no overload or drop messages with the Rust2 multi threaded executor. Then we focusing here on, on, on the multi threaded executor and comparing the, uh, this one with the Apex executor because we already saw a lot of slides with the, the static and single threaded one. Um, so the measurements were done with Apex OS and Apex middleware. So the multi threaded executor runs inside of Apex OS, uh, which is the fork of Rust2. And we're also using the ARMW Apex middleware. So we don't want to compare apples with bananas. So um, here in this setup, we have our Apex OS framework, and only the difference will be the, the executors. The assignment of the nodes to the Apex OS executor instances um, and the core affinity was, was chosen to best meet uh, the target KPIs. So in this case, um, we made some core affinity and assigned the behavior planner and all the nodes after behavior planner to core zero, all the LiDAR processing pipeline to core one and two, and the rest of the system to core three. Here we see the, the results for, for the latency measurement of the, the critical path from the LiDAR drivers to the object collision estimator. We see that we could reduce the, the latency and we also have a, you know, a much lower standard deviation. This is with the, the default number crunching um, that the reference system has. And a good thing with the reference system is that you can just turn off this number crunching and then you would have a, um, a system running that is just uh, doing the, the, the framework job and, and no, no, you know, no CPU usage on, on the user side. And this was done here on the next slide. So here we, we see on the, on the right-hand side, uh, the multi threaded executor again, on the left-hand side, our Apex OS executor, and measure the latency of the, the critical path without any load. And we see that for the Apex executor, we have a mean latency of about 250 microseconds um, for this chain of for five nodes um, with all the, the middleware and, and execution things to be done. Um, and with the multi threaded executor, we are you know, roughly about 1.8 milliseconds. Here we see the, the, the cheater of the behavior planner, so the cheater of the cyclic task. And we could also reduce the, the cheater here and have a, a quite low standard deviation. And I was quite impressed that with a, with a Linux system, with a real-time patch, um, you can achieve um, you know, a max deviation that is smaller than 20 microseconds here. Now, um, for on this slide, we, we see on the left-hand side, the Apex OS executor and the right-hand side, uh, the, the multi-thread executor again. And each of them with the number crunching turned on and turned off and, and the, the effect on the CPU usage. So compared to the multi threaded executor, we could reduce the CPU usage by roughly 20% in, in the loaded system. And if you turn off the number crunching, then uh, yeah, the, the system only has a CPU usage of 3% with the Apex OS executor. And this, we still had more than 100% with the multi threaded executor. And this was really strange. Um, and I tried to understand it and uh, had a look with my colleagues. And we saw that you know, roughly 80% of the runtime is spent in the, in the RC, RCL CVP wait for work. Um, so this was a, um, is a part of the, the, the code that we, we, we don't use in, in Apex OS. Um, and this 
maybe also not the latest greatest one. So I took another measurement to do the same thing with the, the default Rust2 executors um, with the Rust2 Galactic. Um, and here also we, we see that there's some uh, certain amount of, of CPU load also if, if you have this system running without number crunching. And what is interesting here that um, yeah, the, the, the load for the multi threaded executor is a lot higher than for the single and, and static single one. Okay, this was my presentation. Happy to ask or also answer, sorry, answer questions you might have. The first oh, we have only one on the chat. Not sure what happens if a subscription is nothing to be taken. I think that that goes to the um, ready concept. Yeah. So um, if if a subscription has nothing to be taken, if it's a triggering subscription, then this, this would not trigger the wait set. So you, you the executor will not wake up and uh, and, and execute something. Um, and then it's up to you. So um, we are we're using DDS in a way that um, if you don't take them. Let me think about. Um, I think you 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 have to read at least the messages um, to reset mm -hmm. this this event. Um, you don't have to take it, so you can leave it in in, in the in the the cache of the DDS. Um, but you have to ensure that you at least read it um, for ensuring that uh, this will not be triggering the wait set again. Okay, so no other question. Then I have a question. Um, we, we have also observed the, this flame graph. Uh, I know this from, from the single thread executor, multi thread executor, and that uh, really a lot of time is lost in updating the weight set, which means going over all the callback groups, um, getting all the callbacks together, et cetera. Now, with the static uh, single thread executor, one would have expected that this goes really down significantly. Your plots show it's only. Do you have um, do we have insights in where, where the remaining time is lost in the in the static single threaded executor? Um, here you mean? Yeah, exactly. Um, no, good, good, good question. Um, this was the, the last measurement we made. Um, where this time is spent, I don't really know. Yeah. yeah so definitely something to analyze deeper in the yeah. return booking group. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, so disabling this number crunching is a really nice feature of the reference system now. Okay. There's one new new question. Let's say the transform arrives after camera and lidar. The ready returns true, but there's nothing to take on the transform subscription. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is an up to you to to the execution condition that you implement. Um, yeah, in, in my example, I, I assume that uh, the frequency of this transformation will be, will be higher than, than the other ones. Mm -hmm. there, there should always be one. Um, but you, what you also could do if, if there's no update, um, you could also decide in, in your execute input to not take the data, but, but read the data. So it, mm -hmm. the last one will stay in the, in the DDS reader cache. Uh, mm -hmm. So you, you can do this. Um, if you want to ensure that there's also always a new one, then you can change the execution condition to also have a new transformation. Also, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, sorry. Thank you, Michael. All right. I had a question, but I don't guess as a presenter I can put one in the Q and A chat. Do we have time, or do we need to move on? Um, I think we have time. Yeah. Um. So. I was thinking about when you were describing it, I was wondering why you decided to add methods to the node as opposed to adding new entities that can be created. So specifically like, you know, in ROS2, we have this concept of a waitable, which itself can be a guard condition or a subscription or whatever. And I was wondering why instead you didn't have like a wrapper around a, sub a subscription to make that the triggering subscription because i can just imagine that you might have one node and you've got like two subscriptions triggered by one of them and then two completely separate subscriptions triggered by one of those right like you might want more than one execute callback 
right? Yeah. And you know, you're like forcing them all into a single function and you're also extending the interface of the node, which means that if you don't use your executor, those methods never get called and it just doesn't work correctly. And there's really no, this is a known issue. There's no way for a node to say, I need a certain kind of executor back in the other direction. Right, yeah. but if you had something that was just a weightable, every executor would parse it at least. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So, um, so for me, this is also the, always the, the compromise between um, having a, you know, a lean component model for, for, for Node um, and, and, and the flexibility you have with, with the framework. So for, for our customers, they, the, the most are, are used to executing a node and having one entry point to a node, and um, this has a job to be, uh, to be done. Um, with the low level API that we also have, so we have like, like a layout architecture, you could also say, okay, I, I'm using this, this lower layer, level API and I can write a node that has uh, several methods and I then uh, can, can attach uh, or I have different subscriptions that are um, triggering um, attached to different methods of, of this node again. Yeah. It's it's all possible because it's also based on some, some building blocks, um, and you can can build whatever you want. Um, but then with, with with great power also comes great responsibility. And, and this one here is then um, yeah make it as as simple as possible again and say okay this is the the method you have to implement. Um, tell me the triggering subscriptions. Yeah. Makes sense. And then I was just thinking like how could you do this with the existing thing? And like I was thinking about Ralph's talk like. You could do it so that like if you had one subscription triggering for two others, you could just not add those other two to the callback groups that get added. And then in the callback for for the subscription that triggers, you could just take from the other three or whatever, or the other two or whatever. Right. Like you don't really need another mechanism there to do that. Um, yeah. though, it, though it is a little less, like it's more of a trick or something like a pattern than it is like an explicit thing. But yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Thanks.